Okay. Okay, I'll off my mic and my camera as well. Good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for joining the session. I think we just followed a <laughs> fairly big act with uh, hopefully some of you managed to get the Bill Gates session before this one. Uh, I'm uh, Cameron Priest. I'm the ex-CEO of Tragico, um, a Singapore-based inventory order management platform. We recently exited to Intuit, a large American-based technology company, and we're going to be talking to Sangeet uh, Shudari of Platformation Labs. Sangeet is uh, the co-author of the best-selling book, Platform Revolution, sold almost half a million copies, featured among uh, top 10 strategy articles in, in HBR, alongside others like Clayton Christensen and Michael Porter, and advisor to uh, 35 of the Fortune 500, um, helping a lot of large companies kind of understand this new world. So uh, thanks for joining us, Sangeet. It's good to see you. It's been a while since we did this last time. Thank you, Cameron. Yes, looking forward to it. Yep. So I guess to start off, I mean, we're, um, we're really talking about um, the commoditization of financial services, and we're seeing this kind of transition as uh, a lot of technology companies, platforms, marketplaces, SaaS providers are adding financial services to their solutions. And we're seeing this um, with embedded finance, lending, uh, treasury, capital. I guess to start off, I'd love to just kind of step back and understand uh, from your point of view what's happening in the world, and if you can kind of just talk about what you're seeing in this kind of this field. Right. Uh, so when you think about how industries transform because of digital technologies, um, one of the ways to think about it is to look at how things are changing on the demand side and how things are changing on the supply side. So when we think about financial services on the supply side, we have the traditional banking products. They are now becoming more fluid. They're becoming more consumable as APIs. And so banking products are getting increasingly unbundled from the bank. So on the supply side, we're seeing an unbundling and uh, a modularization of the banking product away from the bank. What then happens on the demand side at, at the same time is that consumer relationship is no longer the prerogative of the creator of the product. In the, in the past, we had to walk into a branch to get a loan, but today a loan can be served to you on, on Zillow if you're if you're a property guru in Singapore, for instance, if you're uh, working on a, on a uh, house hunt uh, platform and, and you're looking for a home, uh, you could be served a loan right there. And so the, the ownership of the consumer relationship is again getting unbundled from the traditional provider of product. And so what happens with this is because of an unbundling on the supply side with products moving away from the providers and being served into new contexts and an unbundling on the demand side where the demand can now be served at any location. It can be served uh, by an external retailer, by uh, a third party platform. Because of this, we see the creation of entirely new markets and ecosystems. And that is what I think of as the rebundling where products from a third party can be served into a third party consumer context. So the supply side, the demand side, both of them could be completely unbundled from the traditional bank channel and could be reconfigured into new ecosystems. And that's the real shift that we are seeing. Now, the reason this shift is important is because very often we see these infographics about fintechs are unbundling the bank or, uh, you know, marketplaces are unbundling Craigslist and so on. What we've seen in the past with digital economics and what I talked about yesterday as well in uh, on, on the main track uh, in the panel was is that unbundling is rarely a source of a sustainable business model. Business or business value is created when you have rebundling. And, and 
if you just take a couple of examples, uh, think of um, news as the best example. Newspapers used to be the traditional bundle and they would bundle content, but also bundle advertising with it. And that would work very well. And what uh, web enabled distribution did was that it, it unbundled the news uh, items from the newspaper, allowed them to flow individually, just like what's happening with financial products today, and then allowed these news items to be plugged into any third party context. And the companies that made money uh, in this whole shift were companies that rebundled news to serve it to the consumer, either as a search engine, which is what Google did, or as a news feed, which is what Facebook did, or ever since that, we're starting to see other forms of rebundling coming up. So we're seeing something very similar in financial services. I don't want to overstretch the analogy, but the point is that money is made in rebundling and rebundling happens in the ecosystems. And it's the uh, modularity or the unbundling of supply and demand and reconfiguration of the, the supply and demand in new ecosystems. That's the big trend that we are uh, seeing right now. And completely understand that. And so with um, we saw this last week, we saw for an example, Stripe launched Capital and Treasury as a service. And I think their first uh, customer is Shopify, one of the fastest growing technology companies of the last couple of years. Yeah. What is the impact of Grab and Pingang? And I know you kind of touched on it, but I'd love to kind of understand more in depth and maybe more regionally as well, um, effectively of these non-banking platforms using this superior distribution. Um, and if probably, you know, over time as they rebundle, taking the, the profitable parts of the value chain, how do you see that impacting? Yeah. Um if you think of, so, so let's talk about two different things. Stripe, which is very much starting as uh, a thin layer at the API level. And uh, we'll then go on to talk about Pingan and Grab, which are kind of hitting two parts of the value chain. At least Pingan is hitting both uh, the front consumer facing part of it, uh, as well as the financial infrastructure side of it. But if you think of Stripe, uh, let me start there. Stripe is super interesting because Stripe started as a way to abstract payments capabilities into an, a simple API call. So developers found it difficult to keep stringing payments uh, together, working with traditional legacy payment systems. Stripe abstracted all of it into a set of API calls and made life easy for developers. Around 2012, a uh, couple of years uh, around, uh, or 2013, a couple of years after Stripe started, Stripe realized that the biggest opportunity was not just in providing payments at the API layer, it was in resolving payments across multiple parties in marketplaces and platforms. And uh, think of Lyft, think of Shopify, think of uh, any of these uh, platforms where you have to aggregate payments and then distribute it across merchants. That is a repeatable quantum of code that has to be repeatedly created by every marketplace. And what Stripe did with it abstracted all of that code into a single API call. In doing so, Stripe established something very important, which, which today uh, I, I would argue is, uh, uh, you know, is one of the weak points of Shopify in the Stripe relationship. Um, Stripe in doing this, in abstracting all of this code, because it had to reconcile the payments back to the merchants, it started managing the identity of the merchants. And the moment it started managing the identity of the merchants, it fundamentally disintermediated the financial relationship away from a Shopify, away from a Lyft, and took that up with the merchants. And that is what is helping it rebundle, you know, a treasury, uh, uh, bank accounts, lending, all of this back towards the financials, uh, towards the merchants today. So it's the it's the ability to control the relationship or the financial relationship with the merchant, control the flow of money to the merchant. And using that ability to actually disintermediate the disintermediators, if you will, because all these platforms are disintermediating traditional companies and, and Stripe came in and kind of disintermediated them at the back end. And uh, if you really take that a step forward, what Stripe has also tried to do, which uh, companies like Shopify should, would probably be more concerned about, is it's tried to then partner with companies like Twitter with Stripe Relay so that you Stripe has the merchants, it doesn't have the distribution. Twitter has the distribution, it doesn't have the merchants. You bring the two together, put a pay now button on Twitter, and that's how you set up you know, a cross-platform platform or a platform of platforms, right? And, and that, I think that's where the, uh, where the money is for Stripe because it's not just the rebundling, but also the fact that it uniquely owns the merchant identity across platforms. Now, if we take that, that's one form of free bundling, which is entirely around the merchant. Grab is doing a fundamentally different form of free bundling where it started with transportation and realized fairly early on that transportation is not a very good network effects game because the, the 
cost to switch from a Grab to a Gojek to an Uber is super low, which is why again and again we see consolidation happening in these industries because it's not winner take all. So uh, transportation or ride hailing is high cost, low margin, high burn rates, and that's why you see a lot of funding and a lot of consolidation and you never see one company emerge like a Facebook or a LinkedIn, which has more defensible network effects. And that's why uh, as of last week, I believe this Grab Gojek merger discussion started as well. So that's the natural end point of anything in ride hailing. But starting from that, the second part of it is that ride hailing gives you a daily use case by which you get access to the consumer's relationship. Ride hailing in itself is not the profitable uh, model or, or the, the profitable business. It's, it's uh, a way to subsidize the acquisition of that consumer's relationship. And then you bundle multiple elements, you, you bundle multiple value propositions to the consumer, which arguably WeChat has done really well. And, and a, a, a big reason for that is, is also uh, the near monopolistic run that Tencent had earlier with QQ and then with WeChat, as also the fact that um, uh, communication is, is a much more horizontal and much more frequent use case. So it remains to be seen how effectively we can move from transportation to all forms of financial services. But that's that's where they're really going after. Uh, that would, that's what they're really going after with this whole uh, super app strategy. And I'll just talk about the final thing that you mentioned, Pingan, because these are three different strategies. One was merchant identity as a, 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 a source of rebundling. The second was consumer identity as a source of rebundling. Pingan is more of a combination of consumer identity further up the value chain, but also vertically integrating and tying that back with financial infrastructure that you own. So Pingan st started as a health insurer, moved into Pingan Good Doctor, and that became a source of consumer uh, relationship or gaining the consumer relationship. Um, doctors are, are advise uh, you know, patients over Pingan Good Doctor, and Pingan Good Doctor learns from all of this and eventually might commoditize the doctor as well. Um, but what's really interesting is that all of this is tied back to or bundled back uh, across the value chain with with strong financial infrastructure, which is proprietary to to Pengan. So uh, the financial infrastructure to manage uh, healthcare insurance claims, uh, the financial infrastructure to work with cities on their health data, all of this is managed by Pengan and all of this then vertically integrates back into the demand side ownership of Pengan Good Doctor. So it's a whole, it's three different configurations, all of them very powerful rebundling models. And so I guess we're, we're here talking about, uh, uh, you know, the impact this is having on banks. What is, you know, how do you see this impacting banks over the, or I guess let's call it traditional financial institutions over kind of the, the medium to long term? Uh, right. short, yeah. Yeah, so um, at a minimum, what, what you're going to see happen is that uh, financial products in, in themselves, our financial services are, are going to get increasingly commoditized because uh, the reason you could protect the margin in financial services to a large extent was uh, information asymmetry. And the fact that you can now push financial services, make them compete uh, to get to the consumer, uh, say have co competition across mortgages to provide the best mortgage to somebody who's searching for a house on Zillow or Property Guru, that kind of uh, that kind of leads to increasing commoditization. It's it's similar to what happened with uh, Amazon and merchants because what you see on Amazon is the buy now button on Amazon. Uh, is the single most contested piece of inventory. And if you have to become the default merchant on buy now, uh, you, there's a whole industry of pricing tools now to make that happen, right? It's no longer um, manual anymore. So we're going to start seeing that happening. We're going to start seeing banks becoming increasingly commoditized. We're going to start seeing robots uh, coming in that do a lot of this negotiation with platforms for banks to um, change their pricing in the right way. But at the end of the day, that's not going to be where the money is. The money is further up the value chain or further down the value chain, not in the middle. You either go up the value chain, get primacy of consumer relationship, own that, and then funnel everything through the bottleneck you've created, just like the super app is doing, or you go down the value chain and say, I'm just going to build financial infrastructure that everybody else can build on. And through that, I set a standard for the industry, which to a large extent, what companies like Ant and Pingan are doing right now. And so where do you see the, like, I mean, what, what have you seen banks doing successfully at the moment? I mean, to say they kind of can go either way, sitting in the middle is kind of a, a scary place for them to stay. 
Um, what have you seen, you know, companies around the world that you've advised or seen otherwise that's kind of doing interesting things? Yeah, I think banks are looking to do a couple of different things. Um, first, one of the most common um, uh, efforts that banks are looking to get into is provide this intermediary play, what is not now called a banking as a service platform, provide that intermediary play, which essentially uh, it's, it aggregates two things. It aggregates the fluid supply, which can plug in anywhere, and it aggregates the various demand endpoints where the consumer could be sitting. And so if you cannot end up owning the consumer, the next best position is that you create this thing in the middle. The problem with creating this thing in the middle, or for that matter, not just for financial services, but the same thing is happening with connected cars, for instance. Every every car create, creates its own data, and every fleet manager wants that data, and so vehicle data hubs are coming in between. The problem with these uh, uh, banking as a service platforms or vehicle data hubs in between are that in the long run, it's very difficult to establish a few platforms that completely win without commoditizing a lot of layers and working across uh, each other and interoperating across each other. So in the long run, this is going to be a volume game. It's not going to be a traditional platform ecosystem game where it's about network effects and it's about uh, uh, taking sizable margins on, on certain kinds of transactions. So it's going to be a volume game because if, if multiple banks start, start creating banking service platforms, eventually they'll have to interoperate to reduce the, the, the burden on, on, on the connectors. But that's one of the uh, plays that, that's increasingly happening. Um, I expect that more things are going to be standardized over there. There are going to be standards for interoperability across these that are going to be created. And eventually the few that win will also successfully engage developers the way Stripe did. Because that is, if you really look at what is scarce, where is the scarcity, it's in developer innovation. Uh, connecting multiple APIs from multiple banks is not the scarcity. Anybody can do that with sufficient investment, but getting developers to engage and create new innovation is the scarcity. So that's one piece which banks are running towards. The second piece uh, is uh, around thinking about new financial infrastructure, right? And one of the best examples of this is, is JP Morgan, which uh, while um, uh, looking at, uh, you know, as part of its uh, wholesale banking, looking at uh, ways to use machine learning to read contracts, uh, it's, it ended up creating something called COIN, which is uh, uh, now uh, an infrastructure that uh, can be used by other banks, but can more so be used by the legal industry. So finding new opportunities to create these technology infrastructures is a second uh, potential play. And um, a third potential play is, is going to be just looking for ways to serve the underserved players, um, whether it's students, whether it's ca the cash economy, farmers, Underserved markets, if you can be the first to serve them, you now have the primacy of customer's relationship, and then you can create that funnel, uh, that bottleneck to, to uh, eventually get to them, which is why a lot of these experiments are happening with uh, Western banks uh, working, you know, banks in uh, mature Western markets working in Africa and Asia to, to go after these underserved segments. And I mean, I know you uh, advise a lot of uh, large organizations and banks or some of those. I don't know if there's anything you can speak about, but like what else is coming up on the horizon? What are you kind of working with these guys on advising at the moment? Is there anything else that you can kind of share, uh, maybe without naming names? We're curious to understand what else you're kind of focusing on when you're looking at these problems with these large yeah. you know, businesses. There are a couple of things that are uh, that are still, still fairly early and it's, it's anybody's game to win. The first of these is trade infrastructure. Because uh, it's it's widely understood that whether it's trade of goods and services, uh, especially trade of goods and services, but even trade of digital goods and services, um, the infrastructure for these is fundamentally going to change. It's not going to be the traditional infrastructure that we've used so far. And the traditional infrastructure, to a large extent, was pen and paper and uh, companies like Bolero and their stocks that would just merely digitize the workflow without making them fluid and, and uh, interoperable. Um, trade infrastructure is changing. Um, at this point, I believe we are still fairly early in this game. You, you look at a bank like HSBC with Jasmine 22 or Serai, I think that's what they call it now. They're going after trade infrastructure in a way. Um, other banks are getting into consortia. Um, almost every bank is part of some blockchain consortium, right? Uh, and that's <laughs> that's uh, one of those things that you just need to take the box on, even if it doesn't uh, fit with your strategy. That's where things are at this point. But the point is that... Uh, um, Trade infrastructure is going to change. We don't yet know what that future trade infrastructure is going to look like. There are at least three different efforts that are underway. Uh, there is um, 
Um, there's the blockchain infrastructure that these banks are creating. There's uh, Alibaba creating electronic world trade platform in partnership with countries. And then there are countries, companies like TradeShift uh, that are creating this trade infrastructure as well in closed ecosystems relatively. So that's, that's one uh, you know, theme. Got it, got it. And I mean, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit off the bank thing, but it's something that I've read about and you, we've talked about before that I find really interesting. You spoke about, um, or you've written about what you've seen maybe Singapore trying to do with this kind of trade infrastructure as well. Is that something that you see as developing? I mean, you, I know you wrote about it a couple of years ago. Is that kind of moving like you thought it would? Uh, I, I wrote about that a couple of years ago in the Singapore context. I think it's beginning to move more rapidly uh, with COVID coming in and with you know things becoming more virtual, especially trade also becoming a lot more virtual. Um, but uh, uh, I, I recently uh, you know uh, did another research with uh, Brookings Institution, which was about how China is doing this, and that's actually the most interesting part of this because China uh, has created. Um, a, a public-private cooperation framework where Alibaba and Ant Financial uh, they they work in sync with China's digital Silk Road, which is the digital uh, way of the Belgian Road. And uh, in in doing that, uh, China is kind of uh, the combination of China as a country and Alibaba and Financial as companies are setting up future trade infrastructure and future payments infrastructure. And if I just give a couple of examples. Electronic trade platform by Alibaba launching in Malaysia, set up at the KL International Airport. That's one example. Setting up digital free trade zones, connecting them back to the hub in, in China, and then feeding all of this activity into uh, Alibaba's uh, e commerce eventually at the end of the day. Um, China as a country then supplements that by setting up global uh, judicial uh, systems that will um, arbitrate disputes in global trade uh, by creating those central judicial systems. And so there's kind of a public-private cooperation that's uh, driving its own little network effect, if you will, which makes the judicial system in China stronger the more Alibaba EWTP trade increases. They're doing the same thing with uh, uh, you know, with payments where um, Ant Financial invests in the leading payments wallet in every country on the condition that they move their technology to Aliyun, which is Alibaba Cloud. And in doing so, ultimately, all payments wallets will start becoming interoperable at the back end because you don't have to now rely on the traditional SWIFT rails. You now have this, uh, this common cloud at the back end through which you can eventually move towards interoperability. And they're also working with banks to do the same. Uh, the value proposition is we'll help you lend to the cash economy. You make more money, but then move to our infrastructure. And if you then combine that with China's strategy of um, building uh, a new cryptocurrency and uh, using that uh, for payments along the Belt and Road, uh, all of that then works together as well to, to create a new payment infrastructure. But, so that's probably the most evolved uh, strategy uh, following this whole country level platform model. Got it. And look, I mean, um, we, we, we both speak very fast and so we've gone through a lot of uh, the questions I had on key, but I think one that I'd um, I'd love to kind of, and we can definitely open up to the audience if there's any questions as well afterwards, but um, we, we obviously this, this, this talk is predominantly focused on banks and hopefully people predominantly from the bank industry attending this talk. I mean, we, we talked about a lot of what's happening, a lot about what they can do, but you know, how should they be responding to this? What are potential strategies um, that they can employ? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things to to keep in mind is um, that is is that banks will have to think about where they can use their regulatory position to their advantage and which assets they have to shed. It's going to be difficult for a bank to completely say, "I'm going to be the next square." Um, it's <laughs> Uh, and, and, and and it's not going to be the right approach to it anyway, uh, even if they have the, the innovation jobs to do it. Uh, because um, part of it is the fact that um, there's there, there are certain things, uh, there's, there's certain components that are going to be a little more difficult to digitize uh, or, or to, to completely disintermediate. So uh, deposits is one part of it. Deposits are heavily regulated. You're not going to see, um, uh, you know, Stripe may come in and say, I'll set up the bank account, but it's going to be backed by another bank. Uh, so what we may start seeing eventually on the deposit side is we may start seeing more consolidation among banks as uh, more of this commoditization happens. The smaller banks may not have the economics in their, uh, in, in their scale to, to fight the commoditization because ultimately pricing of banking products is, is very much driven by balance sheet scale. So yeah. we may start seeing as a result of commoditization, we may start seeing more consolidation. And with consolidation, uh, we may end up in a 
in a, in a better negotiating position where the consolidated banks may have a stronger position to negotiate with the large platforms that are kind of taking the customer relationship. Uh, so I, I do want to highlight the regulatory part of it. The second part of it that I do want to highlight, and again, I'll start with strategy first before I go to product, because uh, very often in this whole talk about innovation, we miss out the, uh, on strategy and that a lot of strategy is actually using regulation to your advantage. Um, so. A second, so the first part of it is what I mentioned, consolidation will help banks uh, as and when that happens. The second thing that's important is that even as we wait for consolidation to happen, we have to simulate consolidation through collective action. And if you look at uh, any industry, and literally even the platforms do it, the only way to compete with a dominant platform is to not go against it head on, but to, to uh, join forces and commoditize the platform strength. One of the best examples of this is what happened, what's happening in the mapping industry. So Google has this monopoly over Google Maps uh, started way back in 2004 with the acquisition of Keyhole and kept on building it since then. Now maps just learn of their own data. It's now become you don't even need to collect more data. That's where Google is. But um, what, what we started seeing is uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, all these companies com com competing in every other part of the value chain, but on maps, they've come together, they've uh, come and banded with each other uh, around this thing called OpenStreetMap. And they're essentially, the goal is, when you can't compete with Google, you have to commoditize that. So they're not going to make money out of maps. The only way they can uh, uh, you know, shift Google's power is by commoditizing maps completely. Take that as an example, because in, if banks were to do that, regulators would come in and say, hey, this is the cartel, and they would want to break that up. But you have to think about you know, regulation as well. You have to think about it in a, in a, in a fresher lens over here, because a lot of, this, uh, a lot of uh, tech startups for a long time have been talking about how regulation is evil, but it's actually helping them uh, play because regulation comes and attacks the banks, but not them. So think of this map piece and uh, that's that is collective action at play now think of two countries where this has played out in different ways because the regulator took a different approach in australia apple pay came in and the the banks started banding up together they were broken up uh, in sweden something entirely different happened where the banks took a, a first mover uh, approach towards it set up a payment system uh, and that payment system i'm forgetting the name but that payment system is now used by 70 percent of the population, not just the, uh, you know, I'm not just saying a, a bank's customer base, but 70% of the Swedish population. And so when Apple Pay, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Swish, the government. Uh, Swish, the Swish. it is Swish, yes. Um, when Apple Pay came in, they had to be a player in the ecosystem rather than commodify the banks in their own ecosystem. So collective action is super important. We can talk about product as well, but I want to highlight that strategy is very often missed when we're thinking about how you compete against these platforms. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I know that the banks in the United States have tried to, to attack with Zelle, right. which is going up against Square Cash and Venmo, but my understanding is it's not being very, very successful. Obviously, you're seeing different things in different countries, but that's uh, yeah, very interesting. I mean, do, you, do double tap on the product. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. Tell me what you're th you know, thinking there. Yeah, so the other way to think about it is where do you compete across the value chain with products, right? Where do you, or, or rather uh, with, with innovation, let's just call it innovation because I don't want to confuse product and platform, but where do you compete across the value chain? What positions do you, do you take up? So um, what's becoming increasingly clear is that you cannot just become the super app just because you say you want to be the super app. Every company today wants to be the super app, right? Now, the, the challenge is that uh, the biggest misconception about a super app is that a super app is an app that has multiple apps. The, the constraint and or the competitive advantage of a super app is not in aggregating supply, it is in aggregating demand. And that is the part that is complex. Getting 100 million consumers or 50 million consumers, whatever that, that be, getting consumers at that scale aggregating them and being the central point of serving them, that is competitive advantage. So the challenge that I see with a lot of banks is to say we're going to be super apps, we're going to be a one-stop shop, and then they literally start building a one-stop shop, pulling together third-party services, showing a nice interface, but it doesn't matter because you're aggregating supply with us, you should be aggregating demand. And in response to that, once you do that, you should then funnel in supply. And so that simple nuance is completely misunderstood by a lot of banks. So I, I believe that most banks will fail with super app strategies just because 
it's it's the same thing you you you're not a super app until your relationship with the customer is unbundled from your current relationship with the customer as a bank you can be a super app only if you can answer the question how will my competitors customer become my customer tomorrow yeah. you, you can't do that by just saying how can i serve my customer more things that's not a super app model so um the so i don't think banks are going to really succeed with that uh at, in 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 a big way uh, every bank doing the same thing will continue to serve their customer base plus a little more what is going to likely happen or or where you would see opportunities is banks that do one of two things they either figure out a fundamentally new way to do credit scoring and uh, gain a data advantage around those credit scoring models and then they can use that to plug into a whole range of different platforms and inform the credit scoring over there make money of that but also by virtue of uh doing better credit scoring acquire consumers on the side and start uh, aggregating them towards a super app or a platform strategy so uh, the credit scoring piece is is going to be key it's not funneling in the the products but getting that that unique advantage through through data uh, the second piece that's going to be important is uh, uh, banks that use uh, non traditional signals to do kyc and and uh, uh, identify fraud and and so on so um a lot of um a lot of the economics of running a financial institution can be disrupted if you figure uh, if if you figure out uh, a substantially cheaper way of doing one of these two things and that then allows you to pass the advantage back to consumers that allows you to aggregate consumers and then you can start thinking about well now we're in a position where we can do a super app strategy so these nuances are are often lost on banks because they're just looking at what's visible at the customer interface they're not really looking at what's beyond the so called interface innovation what's happening in the value chain where this the 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 control position located across that value chain so that's uh, you know on the innovation side that's one piece i would i would think about um the other pieces in terms of financial infrastructure because as i mentioned if you think about financial infrastructure products and services customer relationship this thing in between is going to get commoditized money is going to be at the top or at the bottom and uh, if you think of that distinction um financial infrastructure you'll have to think about again two types of strategies where do we work with other banks to create something that is completely open source shared commoditized so that we we beat the platforms at their own game and where do we then create our unique infrastructure so that we can compete and and spread across uh, the industry i i think that where banks are getting the strong uh, right now is they're trying to go head on with platforms if ant creates financial infrastructure we create a uh, similar financial infrastructure which is good if you have ant scale but not good if yeah. you don't and so that's where you need collective action again and uh, again like i mean and uh, it might be a hard question but have you seen anyone doing this any banks anywhere i mean uh, around the world doing it well Sorry. um i, I think uh, um, as as i mentioned it's it's happening in different pockets so some banks are getting some things right some banks are getting some things right to a lesser extent so uh, as, um, jp morgan as i mentioned uh, with financial infrastructure is one example uh, there's a really small uh, bank in uh, italy uh, it's a family owned bank uh, that i have advised at various points uh, called banca sella and uh, they've they've kind of done a really interesting platform strategy because they've taken this theory to heart how do you take Uh, how do you build something which can go beyond your customer base and serve a larger number of customers and uh, that's where they built something called fabric which is now the leading platform in italy uh, now i know italy is a small country but you have to realize that the traditional banking operations of this bank were with that it was one of the smallest banks in italy it was uh, you know uh, in the bottom 10 out of 35 banks in italy but in terms of a platform it's the dominant platform in italy because nobody else did that and they've done it and now they're moving beyond italy with this model so that's a great example of how you use a platform strategy to completely uh, move beyond your your current constraints but no, that's fascinating and i i, I again I, i i've seen um i think we've both seen a lot of these uh uh well in, in pockets of these businesses banks that are being quite innovative as you said doing banking as a service is one in australia there's obviously a few in the united states serving huge growth in startups and we'll see if those startups themselves actually end up making any money at scale because right. running a bank <laughs> is a lot more work 
as you said, um, with credit scoring and risk and losses and all the things that come with when you're uh, looking after people's money. Um, I guess, uh, look, I, I'd love to see if there's any questions from the audience. I'm not sure if there are any popping up at all. Um, I think we've got some guys on the side there. If there's anything else you wanted to kind of cover, um, I, I think we've covered a lot of the, what we were going to talk about. Um, I'll see if the, the, the team has got anything that anyone wants to ask, uh, Sangeet or myself. I'm not seeing or hearing anything. Look, um, um, is there anything else? No questions? Cool. All right, nothing so far. I guess uh, everyone's been uh, busy listening to you, Sangeet, too, too, too busy to think of interesting questions. I, I, anything else you want to kind of leave everyone with, Sangeet? Or, um... Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think let, let, let's talk about small businesses, right? Because that's something you've executed deeply as well. And, yeah. and this is probably I'm just, just riff off of that. Um, so, uh, Small businesses, for instance, have been traditionally underserved because of banks and largely because uh, the, the cost of serving small businesses did not justify the complexity uh, when you could uh, just focus on wholesale or get the numbers through retail. So the small businesses were kind of stuck in between. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, technology is going to help us do um, uh, is is help small businesses at scale. And we, that's where we're seeing a lot of the innovation with Square and, and Stripe and even what you built. Uh, because uh, the, this was a, a large um, underserved part of the market, so um, that is, that is my um, you know yeah, that, that, one that, that, opportunity. Yeah, that, 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 that is yeah. Really yeah. Across my heart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're seeing it. Obviously, at, at Trekigo, we did it in a small way. At, at, into it, we do it in a large way. We use banking right. as a set of platforms to power uh, payments. We're now doing checking accounts. And I think, I don't know if you read the same numbers as I do, but, you know, access to capital, access to loans is the one of the largest, is the largest impediment to small business growth and supporting the growth of small businesses. So it, I, I think it's exciting what Square is doing, what Shopify is doing, what Intuit's doing. You know, it, it's sort of stuff we always wanted to do at Traeger. We never had the scale, as you kind of rightly pointed out. You need the, you need the supply, um, uh, you need the demand, sorry, before you can really pump in the supply. But a lot of large platforms are doing it. Um, we... I haven't seen I haven't seen a huge amount in Southeast Asia yet, but there's some really interesting stuff in Australasia. Um, and obviously the US is very far ahead. And you know, obviously Alibaba and those guys are doing a lot of that in the in, in China. Capital is very quick to access and so on and so forth. It's a very interesting stage. Um, and as you said, that's all just unbundling what you would have either not got at all, or if you, you could have got it from a bank potentially, but yeah. been a lot of to jump through. Um, or you most likely wouldn't have been able to get a loan or even been able to factor your invoices. Uh, so definitely very interesting in that regards. Yeah, and there's a there's a very interesting nuance over here, if I can just, uh, you know, play off that, which is that uh, when we talk about retail, um, when we talk about mortgages, loans, payments in the consumer context, financial services are secondary demand. Nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, I want to buy a loan. Or I want to get a, I want to pay with my credit card. Nobody thinks that people think of what they want to buy a house a car they want to buy something at a shop and the financial product gets kind of embedded into that experience and today embedded finance is fundamentally exactly that you embed a financial product into a demand for an actually actual primary product now what we miss is that when we think of small businesses the primary demand and the secondary demand are the same because i want to run my business and capital is a big part of it payroll is a big part of it uh, inventory, supply chain finance is a big part of it. And so there's no distinction between primary demand and secondary demand. Uh, what I do sell, how, how well I sell it, what my relationships are with users, you can move to all of that if you provide me capital and if you provide me payments as well. So that uh, the fact that uh, primary demand and secondary demand are the same in small businesses, but they are two different things in consumers, that makes a big dis difference because on the consumer side, you can have an Amazon or a Facebook or a WhatsApp come in and take the primary demand and banks <clears throat> don't have a chance to move from secondary to primary. But in SMEs and small businesses, owning the secondary demand is a good enough starting point towards then moving into primary. And just this simple nuance is, is something that banks don't understand uh, sufficiently as well. And, and uh, uh, still a, a a focus a lot on the retail side where, where they can, uh, you know, they have a better economic bridge uh, uh, towards the primary demand on the small business side. So I think that's the big untapped opportunity today, uh, if you think of banks. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, it's interesting, though. I mean, the, the, you know, banks both have the, as you said earlier, 
the the regulatory kind of um, uh, you know uh, moats or kind of defensibility in, in, in a geographical kind of area more often than not. Obviously, there are some many banks that are globally as well, but whereas platforms have a you know much easier way of going global, getting the kind of demand. And uh, it kind of forces the banks into that commoditization position potentially. Um, I, I would imagine. Um, I'm not sure if you'd agree or not, but I can see how that would make it much easier for a platform to go work with a bank uh, as a banking service than for the banks to become the platform, as we touched on. No, I, I, I agree. I think um, this is this has been uh, a personal journey for me as well because I, I've been uh, thinking platforms since back in 2006. Uh, and I've been working with financial services, at least on the platform side since 2008, um, since my time at Intuit. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that, um, you know, it's been a journey for me as well to understand that not every company is well set up to become a platform. Not every company should be thinking about an ecosystem and uh, or, or being the, the single keystone in the ecosystem, the central player. But at the same time, when you say that, people then think the next the next option is you either do nothing or you just participate in other ecosystems, which is where I'm bringing up these ideas that, uh, um, and this has kind of been a revelation for me as well over the years, that some of the best strategies to compete in a world of platforms are not about becoming platforms, but to set up alternate infrastructures, set up collective action mechanisms, figure out new ways to work with regulators to make things happen. And, uh, uh, a lot of those things are, 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 are missed. And, and I think the other part of it that uh, where, you know, if we if we worship too much at the, at the high altar of innovation, uh, which what we end up missing is that serving the customer problem is a great and the only starting point. It is, but it is not the end point. The end point is to use that problem that you solved to identify a new unique asset that you've created around it. It could be a customer relationship. It could be a credit scoring algorithm. What's the new, the new uh, asset you've created around it? And then how can that asset be the center of a new business model? So until you get that piece right, no amount of customer discovery and solving the customer problem is going to help you uh, transform fully. So you need to get that whole nine yards right. So yeah, I just want to bring those two things up as well. And I mean, we can continue riffing on this, but if there are any questions on the side, please let us know so that you know we can take those as well. Yeah, I think uh, the Kajang was saying nothing so far. So uh, okay, we can just keep going. Um, I mean, again, and uh, as it, that makes a, a lot of sense to me. And again, I think as you touched on before, those unique assets, whether it's um, JP Morgan with the with the, with the machine learning in terms of um, reading documents, or whether it's building credit scoring models. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I, I kind of I'd love to understand like what is uh, what are the things that you're kind of thinking about, but are still kind of maybe. Uh, still trying to grok yourself right now is there anything outside of uh that you're kind of focusing on any you know anything you're studying that's you're finding quite interesting that you'd be interested to share more about yeah a big a big focus of my work and uh you know uh dovetailing into my next set of books is uh this whole idea that uh power is concentrating in specific parts of the economy and not all of that has to do with platforms some of that has to do with new infrastructure some of that has to do with uh like Capture, but how do you identify where power will accumulate in across the value chain because of digital technologies coming in? Now, uh, that specific thing, um, you know, uh, understanding that is the key to determining your strategy because uh, no amount of innovation can help you get to the right answer unless you know where future value is going to uh, sit. And if, if I just take a few examples of that, right, because that has happened. Um, in different industries. Um, one of the best examples is possibly the media industry. If you look at um, how the news media industry has transformed, um, and this is this will probably give a good indication for banks to think about how to take up positions. So the, the traditional news bundle used to be, I'm going to provide news, um, you'll have to pay for it. Uh, a bit and then the rest of it will have to be subsidized by advertising and then I'm going to uh, do uh, classifieds along with it. So the bundle was news paid slash unpaid advertising classifieds. What happened was the web unbundled this news became a commodity. Anybody could publish wiki technologies, blogging, all of that came up and so publishing exploded became increasingly commoditized. So 
then you need to think about where this value shifting in the value chain. The first uh, shift happened towards search, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll outline eight shifts that happened or seven or eight shifts that happened in, in the news industry because we, we'll see very similar things happen in the banking industry. And there's no way to predict exactly what will happen, but knowing how it's worked out in a different industry is, is a good starting point. The first shift that happened was that content exploded, distribution exploded, so search costs increased. And... Uh, uh, you know, back in 94, uh, Yahoo came up with this company which was supposed to survive the next 100 years because they were going to dominate the internet, but they fundamentally misunderstood the internet as a place where not only distribution, but content was also going to explode. So because supply was going to explode, you had to have algorithmic curation, which was what Google did with the search engine. So the first uh, control position was in figuring out how to bring down the search costs uh, through um, an expandable index, which is what Google did. The second thing that then happened in the in the news industry uh, or media industry as such was now that everybody's creating content, you need to standardize it. You need to make it. Uh, uh, you know, you need to have new rules. And because Google now controlled the demand side, it was able to set the standard on the supply side, what we now call search engine optimization guidelines. Uh, we may say that Google is open and all of that, but just the fact that Google sets SEO guidelines, Google provides Google Analytics, Google provides a site page optimizer, you have to believe that Google controls the standards and the infrastructure on which the internet is run because everybody is testing it for those uh, tools. So that's the second piece that happened. A third piece that happened much later was in order for Google to control the internet in a much bigger way, they had to get into browsers as well, uh, bundle the search into the browser. And more importantly, because Google Chrome became the dominant browser, all the developers would test their site for Google Chrome. So other uh, browsers like Microsoft's Internet Explorer also shifted to Google's Chromium engine, which is at the back end. And you know, Google puts in some nice hooks at the back end, which prevents, say, with YouTube running very well on Internet Explorer. And through that, even more monopolization happens towards uh, Google Chrome. So that's the third control position that was created in that value chain, which was further down into the actual technology. But what did the traditional companies do? The, the fourth control position that, that came up was when a company called Shipstead Media Group in, in Norway um, woke up one day and said, we can't compete with Google on uh, content. We can't compete with them on search. We can't compete with them on advertising. Let's forget all of that, share all of that, and very brave strategy that today has made them one of the most successful transformation companies. They said, let's take the third part of the bundle. Let's just take uh, uh, classifieds and double down on that. And from there, they, they invested in classifieds companies around the world and today have a portfolio of marketplaces. And 80% of their revenues now comes through platforms and ecosystems. Uh, compared to you know less than uh, less than 10% uh, in 2010 and so um, the 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 you know the the fourth control position is you fundamentally move away from the parts of the bundle that have been rebundled and find the parts that have not been rebundled yet and try to control them in some form um, so Shipset did that. The fifth control position is then to think about, well, all of this works, but nobody still figured out how to make people pay for content, how to monetize that. And so a lot of companies have started to go after that. You've, uh, you see companies like Medium and Substack doing that. But in a much bigger way, uh, once Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, Washington Post created a new platform called the Arc platform, which essentially allows a media company to run their news operations and then charge for that, their, their customers for that. And ARC is trying to become the infrastructure for every media house uh, in the world. And once it does that, they have that infrastructure position. They can change the rules of the infrastructure and create that dominant position. So my, my point is that, you know, the solution to disruption is not as simple as super app is the answer, innovation is the answer, uh, or, uh, you know, platform is the answer. It's about looking at how does the whole value chain transform? What are the various points at which these new positions can be created, which did not exist in the past? That is how you think about where you uh, then create new, entirely new business models. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, again, a little bit went over my head there, but I really want to read those next books. <laughs> so, yeah. And I know you've got a, a, you know, some other stuff you've just released, you know, some of the, the, the courses that you're doing and stuff. So very exciting stuff. Look, I think we've just hit time, and which is great because my two-year-old just woke up <laughs> shouting my name in the background. So I think we uh, we hit it right on the head. Uh, thank you so much, Sangeet, for talking today. It's been a pleasure. And um, hopefully we can catch up in Singapore next time I'm back in town. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you, you too. Everyone. Thanks.